All right, ladies and gentlemen, you are locked on Falcons. I'm your host, Aaron Freeman. And today we're continuing our year in positional reviews, this time talking about the Falcons interior defensive linemen and whether or not the Falcons will keep or move on from Grady Jarrett this offseason. Are Locked On Falcons, your daily Atlanta Falcons podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. So guys, you know me, I'm Aaron Freeman, been covering the Falcons for many years, formerly at Falcfans. Dot com RIP still going strong on Twitter at Falk fans and of course the host of this preeminent Locked On Falcons podcast your daily Atlanta Falcons podcast right here on the Locked On Podcast Network your team every day in today's episode of Locked On Falcons is brought to you by the Get Upside app it you can download Get Upside for free and use the promo code touchdown to get 25 cents back for every gallon of gas on your first fill up so, guys, I want to thank you for making Lockdown Falcons your first listen each and every day. Of course, Lockdown Falcons is free and available on a variety of podcast platforms, including Apple Odyssey, Google, Spotify, as well as now free and available on YouTube. Make sure you subscribe to the Locked On Falcons YouTube channel and give us a like when you do. So today's episode, we're going to be continuing our positional year in reviews, talking about the interior defensive linemen. And for those of you that, you know, this is the position group that used to be called defensive tackles. Uh, if you're working for the National Football League, you still call them defensive tackles, but the rest of the world has moved on and distinguished between D tackles and DNs. Really, it's edge rushers and interior defensive linemen. So if you want to get more thoughts on the edge rushers, the guys that used to be defensive ends or outside linebackers, go check out Tuesday's episode. So the guys that we're going to be talking about on today's episode are Grady Jarrett, Jonathan Ballard, Tyler Davison, Marlon Davison, Taquan Graham, Mike Pinnell, Anthony Rush, and Nick Thurman. Um, and we'll spend a lot of time later in the episode talking specifically about Grady Jarrett, how and why he had a quote unquote down 2021 season and sort of the big potential offseason decision uh, that the Falcons could make, which could include either extending him or trading him. Um, but let's sort of bang out the first, you know, those other seven guys or a handful of those other seven guys pretty quickly to, to start today's episode. And there's not a whole lot to say about them. They were fairly interchangeable this past season. Uh, Pro Football Focus graded all of those guys between a 46 and a 56 with Davison earning the 46 grade and, and Jonathan Ballard o- over earning that 56 grade. And all of those players basically fit into what PFF's grading system, anybody below a 60 is considered replaceable. And that's probably a fair assessment. The Falcons usage of those guys minus Thurman who basically got like 17 snaps in his one appearance at the end of the season, you know, for the other six guys that we're talking about, you know, they were averaging around 25 to 30 snaps per game. So their overall usage was about the same. Uh, Again, continuing that interchangeability. If there was one player out of this six guy group that really kind of stood out at times. And again, it wasn't consistently was probably Anthony rush who tied with Grady Jarrett to be among the team leaders at this position group in terms of run stop percentage. Uh, He was an above average run defender based off of that metric, where if you looked at the 142 interior defensive linemen, according to PFF that had at least a hundred run snaps or or snaps against the run, um, Anthony Rush ranked 40th among those 142 guys, so basically a 70th percentile run defender uh, this past season. And then when you hear sort of how the coaches talked about this group, you know, they kind of essentially said that they were kind of interchangeable. And I want to say it was that first game after the Thursday night game against the Patriots, because that was like the first game this season that I think the Falcons had Tyler Davidson inactive. And I think a reporter asked the team about sort of why he was inactive and essentially Arthur Smith. And I think Dean Pease followed up, you know, shortly thereafter, um, basically saying, you know, at least my interpretation of what they were saying was that they kind of saw their depth as pretty interchangeable with the starters. And from that point on in the second half of the season, you know, some weeks, you know, it'd be Tyler Davidson, some weeks it'd be Marlon Davidson, some weeks it'd be Ballard and Pino and Rush and, and various guys into Quan Graham would be active or inactive 
based largely off of health, uh, as well as sort of what was the game plan for that week. And, and certainly some of the weeks where it looked like the Falcons intended to play a little bit more of that three, four front. That's when they sort of turn more to guys like Rush and Pinnell uh, than necessarily Tyler Davison and, and some of these other guys. And, you know, among this group, it's kind of a shame when you sort of mention Marlon Davidson as kind of interchangeable with all these sort of back in rotational guys. Um, and, you know, given that he was a second round pick two years ago and the, the frank truth is that Davidson really hasn't lived up uh, to his billing. You know, I'm not necessarily completely out or, or down on Davidson. Uh, like, again, he hasn't necessarily lived up uh, to expectations, particularly as a pass rusher. I think he's given the team positive reps as a run defender uh, in his limited workload. But, you know, over two seasons now, uh, two injury plague seasons uh, to be fair to Marlon Davidson, but he's combined to have like four pressures according to PFF. And, you know, the goal probably, you know, when we drafted him, you expected at a minimum him to have like 40 pressures uh, over these last two seasons. So certainly uh, that number is very disappointing. Uh, when you look at this group as they approach this offseason, Mike Pinnell and Jonathan Ballard are both unrestricted free agents. Anthony Rush is a restricted free agent. And Tyler Davidson seems like a, a fairly easy, fairly safe bet to be a cap cut. The Falcons would save about $3.7 million by cutting Tyler Davidson. So it seems like a pretty easy decision given uh, that he's pretty interchangeable with any number of these guys that we're talking about. You know, I think Anthony Rush sends a decent chance of being brought back uh, and, and makes sense to have at least one nose tackle on the roster for when the Falcons, um, you know, play that style of defense. And again, because Rush seemed to stand out among this group as one of the better run defenders, um, you know, as a restricted free agent, I don't think he'll probably get tendered uh, because the lowest tender for RFA would be about $2.4 million. And that just seems a little bit too expensive unless the Falcons are, are fully in on having Rush be the starting nose tackle, which I don't think they are. Um, you know, so I would imagine my best guess being that the Falcons would probably not tender him and that would allow him to be an unrestricted free agent that would allow him to test the market to see if he could get better offers. And I, my guess, and again, this is just me speculating and guessing, uh, my guess would be that the Falcons would give him an offer of like a one year sort of veteran minimum contract, but have part of it guaranteed, you know, have a small signing bonus, but part of his base salary guaranteed. So like you would have a situation where his cap hit may only be like $900,000, but like 200 of that would be guaranteed. And so that would give him some sort of security that he won't necessarily be a cap cut if he makes it to camp and whatever the case may be and, and have a good shot of making the roster. And that's probably going to be a better offer than he would get from a lot of other teams, given that, you know, we found him off the street and he's been primarily a practice squad player these last couple of years. Um, you know, I, I I think Ballard probably won't be resigned. Pinnell's kind of up in the air. You know, the main reason why I don't think Ballard comes back is I feel like Taquan Graham kind of gives you the same and if not potentially more if he can continue to develop. You know, Pinnell does add some beef to the unit, but I feel like, um, you know, you can probably find a comparable player or a better player at that position. But, you know, he could certainly be back if, if he was amenable to a sort of veteran minimum contract. And, you know, I think could arguably be worth that. But obviously, you know, when we look at this group as a whole, you know, the biggest name and the biggest player and the biggest question mark entering this offseason surrounds Grady Jarrett. Uh, and that question mark is sort of dependent on his future, whether or not, you know, the Falcons are going to be committed to extending Grady Jarrett this offseason or, or potentially trading him this offseason, or is there potentially a third path? Uh, and we'll also sort of get into why, or at least the reasons I think Grady Jarrett had a down 2021 season as we continue today's Locked on Falcons, guys. Um, but, you know, uh, given that the Falcons are going to have to make a pretty big decision about Grady Jarrett this offseason, I know some of you guys make pretty big decisions every day based off of how much money and how much gas you're going to put in your car. I know I'm not the only person that has been about that life where you figure out exactly how much money you have to put, how much gas you have to get in your car each and every day so you can get to and from work. Uh, well, you don't necessarily have to live that life anymore uh, by nickel and diming your gas and putting $5 here, $7 here, or whatever the case may be for you. Now with a new app called Get Upside, where you can get cash back on every gallon of gas you put in your car. Uh, there's no cash. You can download Get Upside for free in the App Store on Google Play. And all you got to do is just download the app, go to any of the thousands of eligible gas stations near you across the country, claim your offer, fill up. Uh, they'll put money into your account and then you can cash out anytime you like with direct payments into your bank account with PayPal. You can do what I do and uh, put 
them on Amazon gift cards or other types of gift cards. Uh, and now when you open a, a free account on Get Upside and use our special promo code touchdown, you get a bonus 25 cents back per gallon on your first fill up. So don't pay full price at the pump anymore. Download the free Get Upside app and use our promo code touchdown when you sign up. That's Get Upside promo code touchdown to start saving every time you fill up. So let's start before we get into sort of what the Falcons offseason decision will be surrounding Grady Jarrett. Let's talk about his 2021 season. And I, th I certainly think it's fair to say it was a down year. He earned a 67 PFF grade, which was the second lowest of his career behind uh, his 2016 season, which was his first year as a starter. He had 36 pressures as well, which was the lowest that he's had outside of his rookie season where he barely played. Um, so certainly the lowest of his time as a starter. And then you sort of look at, you know, when he was asked to be a pure pass rusher, looking at PFF's true pass set metrics. And as a reminder, when we talked about true pass set with the offensive lineman, uh, true pass ba set basically excludes all plays where there's less than four rushers, when there's play action and when there's screens, when there's short dropbacks and time to throw under two seconds. So that's basically sort of as it translates for defensive linemen and, and pass rushers, sort of the times when they get to pin their ears back and, and really get after the quarterback and, and you know, teams aren't necessarily scheming uh, away opportunities for them to get pressure on the quarterback. And on those true pass set downs, you know, Grady Jarrett had a grade of 69, which was the second lowest that he's had on true pass set downs over the past six years behind um, only or only ahead of 2017. Uh, his average uh, across the five previous years uh, has been 10 points higher than that 69 grade His pass rush productivity on true pass set down. So his per snap pressure weighted for sacks uh, was 4.8 this past year, which is the worst he's had on these true pass set downs uh, behind even that 2017 season where it was 6.6 .6 and his average pass rush productivity over the previous five years was nearly double what he had this past year, which was 8.8. .8. Um, you know, um, his, his, his past year grade was 4.8 and his average was 8.8 .8 is what I mean. And his true pass set win rate this past year was 14%, uh, which barely edged out the 13.5% he had in 2017. And again, his five-year average uh, in terms of true pass set win rate was around a little shy of 19%. So the question is, why did Grady Jarrett have such a down year relative to what we've grown accustomed to seeing from him over the last three to five years? And I certainly think the scheme, the change in scheme was certainly a factor. Uh, this scheme was a little bit less interested in guys sort of penetrating, get up field and being disruptive and more about guys holding their blocks. I mean, that's further evidence, not only from the pass rush stuff, but by the fact that Grady Jarrett had three tackles for loss uh, after four seasons where he was averaging 10 or more uh, per year. And so we know that Grady Jarrett, given his size, is not necessarily a guy that's built to hold the point of attack. That's not what he did at Clemson. That's not what he did under Dan Quinn and Raheem Morris for five you know, plus years here in Atlanta. So uh, it was kind of a, a square peg and a round hole sort of situation. And then you couple in the, the amount of double teams that he was forced to uh, bear down and occasionally being triple teamed as he famously or infamously was in that Detroit Lions game. Um, you know, but it's hard to sort of see how much, how big a factor that was and, and why he was down. It seemed like watching the film, I did notice watching the film more times when he was often double teamed than in previous years. But when you look at like ESPN's, um, you know, pass rush win rate metrics that also show double team rate and whatnot using that GPS data. Um, it doesn't seem like he was double teamed all that much more uh, than he was in previous years. Now, you you look at it just sort of in a vacuum and you probably will see things like Grady Jarrett was like the second most double team de defensive tackle behind Aaron Donald this year. And you will say, oh, that's why he had a down season. But again, there are, there are caveats to that. Right. You know, second him being second on that list is primarily only if you sort of exclude nose tackles from the data set uh, because double team rate is heavily, you know, influenced by where guys align. So if you line in the, in the a gap, which is what nose tackles typically do, uh, you're going to be double teamed a lot more often than guys that line up in the B gap, which is where Grady Jarrett and, and guys like Aaron Donald typically are. Um, and for those of you that don't know, the A gap is the gap between the center and the guard and the B gap is the gap between the guard and the tackle. Um, and then when you look at Grady Jarrett's double team rate in 2021 compared to 2020, it's not that much different, right? Um, you know, and last year, Grady Jarrett was a top 10 pass rusher. Uh, yet, you know, you look at his double team rate in 2020, uh, he was 
based off my closest estimates, double teamed about 57, 58 percent of the time, according to ESPN. And then this year was about 61, 62 percent. So maybe like a four percent increase in terms of his double team rate. And then you extrapolate that over the course of an entire season. That's maybe about 20, 21 or so plays, um, you know, that he was double teamed more this year than he was last year. You know, but is that significant? I don't know. But then you look at, you know, the fact that he had 57 pressures last year and, and 36 this year. So 21 less pressures this year. And, and again, 21 more snaps of being double teamed. So does that mean that all those extra plays that he was double teamed were plays that in a previous year he would have gotten pressure? Again, I don't necessarily know. And this is part of the reason why I don't put as much stock in ESPN's sort of metrics with these pass rush win rate and the run block win rate and all these various things. You know, it's, it's hard for me to trust nerds with dots and GPS uh, that are out here trying to tell you that Aaron Donald uh, can't defend the run. Kidding or am I? Um, but, you know, it, I think clearly it paints a portrait where regardless of whether you want to put it all on the, the double team stuff or other factors, certainly Grady Jarrett had a down season and that makes the decision that the Falcons have to make this offseason tough. And that decision is based around the fact that Grady Jarrett has a pretty high cap hit, right? And the, the ideal is to lower, you know, save money. Uh, and Dr Grady Jarrett's current 2022 cap hit is the second highest on the team behind Matt Ryan at about $23.8 million. And this upcoming season, 2022, also marks the final year of his current contract. And that is usually the timeline. You don't necessarily want guys going into a quote-unquote lame duck year, particularly players as valuable as Grady Jarrett, and you want to start talking about extensions. That's the normal timeline. This offseason would be the prime time, somewhere at some point in the next six months, you would love to get Grady Jarrett extended under normal circumstances, but, um, you know, are the Falcons in those circumstances? Now, the reason why you want to extend Grady Jarrett, because that's going to potentially lower your, his cap hit considerably. Now, you know, how much that lowers it depends on the structure of the extension, but let's just say the Falcons give Grady Jarrett the exact same deal, a three-year, $63 million deal that Leonard Williams signed last summer, um, you know, from the New York Giants, you know, if they gave him that exact same contract, they would probably save about seven ish million dollars on his cap hit and go from like 24 million to like 17 million. Um, but the other option for the Falcons that could save them even more money is not extending Grady Jarrett, but actually trading him. And if they're not necessarily in the boat of wanting to extend him, you know, it would make sense. And, and if you're not necessarily in, in the boat of extending Grady Jarrett as well as, you know, keeping him here long term in Atlanta, it makes the most sense to, you know, shop him now and see what you can get for him now. And, and that would save a, a lot of cap space, sixteen and a half million dollars if you were to trade him, say, in, in March or whatever the case may be. And I think you could potentially get a first round pick. That's what DeForest Buckner uh, netted the 49ers a couple of years ago when they traded him to the Colts. I think even though Grady Jarrett had a down season. You could probably get a first round pick for him. I certainly think there will be several playoff teams picking in the 20s uh, in the, or at least in the, after pick 15, but maybe not a top 15 pick, but, you know, somewhere between 15 and 32 that would love, you know, to add Grady Jarrett uh, to really enhance their pass rush moving forward and be that final piece uh, to their, you know, interior puzzle, whatever the case may be. So those are sort of the two big options that has been debated here on this podcast a number of times. I've had a number of people come on the podcast over the last couple of months and ask them their opinion on where it goes. And people have asked me my opinion on that. And it's been a sort of a sort of toss up. But the more and more I've thought about it over these last couple of weeks, you know, the more and more I feel like the Falcons probably go with option C, you know, rather than extending him, rather than trading him, they go with option C, and which is to do absolutely nothing and that was something that jeff schultz our guest on yesterday's episode talked about and and sort of indicated that he believes is probably uh the decision that the falcons will ultimately make and essentially punt this decision um with grady jarrett to next offseason which you know in that situation you're not tr necessarily trading him uh because he'll be an impending free agent unless you tag and trade him which again is a whole another complication uh but you know essentially they'll decide after this season where they'll be able to potentially make a more informed decision on whether or not they feel like Grady Jarrett is worth uh, the money that he is. So, you know, I, I think the reason why you wouldn't trade Grady Jarrett is, you know, I think it would be very detrimental to your locker room, right? You know, you would take a, a huge hit in the locker room uh, to trade one of your veteran leaders. Um, and even if you were to sit here and say, okay, well, we're going to trade Grady Jarrett, take all that money and in, in the draft pick or whatever the case may be, and we'll use it, we'll spend that 16 and a half million on a bunch of free agents. 
but it's going to be a bad look in your locker room if you're willing to go outside the organization and bring in all these new fresh faces and pay those guys but you're not willing to pay grady jarrett who i think most people in the locker room and i'm sure a lot of people outside the locker room including myself and, and many of you listening or watching uh believe that he deserves that amount of money so you know i think the the issue is that the falcons don't want to necessarily commit big dollars to anybody right now uh including grady jarrett and you look at the potential price tag that they would have to commit to grady jarrett to get him a deal done you know again that leonard williams contract it was 21 million dollars a year uh 45 million dollars guaranteed to me that's the starting point if you're grady jarrett's agent like you're not taking a penny less than that right and in fact you're taking more than that and much more than that you'll be making aaron donald money because aaron donald's current deal that he signed back in 2018 uh it makes him the highest paid interior defensive lineman in the league uh, he's making about 22 and a half million dollars and i had about 50 million dollars guaranteed on that deal now if you adjust aaron donald's 2018 deal uh, to, in terms of salary cap inflation to 2022 dollars you know that would the equivalent with that would be like 26 and a half million dollars uh this year in terms of his worth so there is some wiggle room between 21 and say you know 26 or so million dollars for the negotiation but certainly the point is that you know i think grady jarrett's agent would certainly want to push that number up as high as possible because Grady Jarrett's agent, Todd France, who Jeff mentioned is, you know, a pretty good agent, pretty tough, is from that CAA sports uh, agency. Um, and it's the infamous talent agency uh, that also represented Julio Jones and Vic Beasley. It's also the agency that represents, that represents Joey Bosa, Aaron Donald, TJ Watt, uh, guys that are among the highest paid players in the league. And so, you know, they're very much incentivized to get those guys, um, you know, big dollars and really move the market forward with some of these guys. So I don't think the Falcons necessarily want to get in bed with that decision right now until they can make more informed decision potentially in 2023. Again, it's, as Jeff kind of indicated it doesn't paint a, a very optimistic portrait that they're going to be able to get Grady Jarrett on a cheap deal at any point. Um, and, you know, it may be putting themselves in a, in a predicament next off season uh, where it's going to be a tough negotiation and they may have to franchise tag him and, and that may get things ugly again. But I think right now the Falcons kind of just want to punt that decision uh, into the future. Hopefully they will be in a more advantageous salary cap situation uh, in terms of 2023, uh, they'll be a little bit more informed on sort of where this team is in its, you know, development. If they have, you know, let's say a scenario where they have like a four and 12 season or a four and 13 season, I'm sorry, it's still forget the 17 games, but like, let's say they have a real rough season all of a sudden, you know, it's, we're going to be looking at a situation heading into 2023 where that more sort of tear down full rebuild sort of situation may be a little bit more, you know, uh, the direction that the team wants to go, but if they can improve upon their seven and 10 record and, and make a run at the NFC South or whatever, where a lot of people are hyped on the team potentially doing that, then all of a sudden you can be like, yeah, let's, let's keep Grady Jarrett together. Let's see if we can make this playoff push. Uh, and, and if that means giving him like a two or three year extension that pays him 40 or, or $50 million over the next two or three years, then so be it. That's worthwhile because we're going to be in the, in the thick of things. And so, that's where we're kind of at, I think, with this team's salary cap situation where they just kind of are going to punt as many of the sort of long term big decisions, big negotiations as they can, including Grady Jarrett to next offseason. And so we'll just sort of have to see. And I, I think we'll probably wind up seeing Grady Jarrett still counting around that 24, 23 point eight million dollar cap hit uh, as things go along. They do have the option to restructure. Uh, in their back pocket, not a typical restructure, but restructure by adding some voidable years and lowering his base salary and then spreading that over some voidable years um, in, in their back pocket. And I imagine, again, again, speculating as we often do at this point in time, because, again, don't really know what's going to happen this offseason, just guessing. But I imagine that would be a sort of a break glass in case of emergency sort of option for them later in the summer if they need some uh, cap space to free up the sign of rookies or if they need some cap space going into the season uh, where they can make some moves and have some cap space heading into the season. So I think that would be sort of a last not a last resort, but a last option, sort of like that's something that they keep in their back pocket, similar to how they waited and they did it twice. But like they restructured Deion Jones's contract right before 
um, the season hit uh, as a way to free up some extra cap space going into the season. So that I think is, is going to be a potential option. So um, I think instead of, you know, making a big decision about Grady Jarrett, instead this off season, you're going to see this team looking to find and surround Grady Jarrett with more help so that they can feel much better about paying Grady Jarrett big money because he's going to actually be able to play, you know, some of these remaining prime years where he's got maybe two or, or more of these after this season, uh, you know, along a good defensive line and the Falcons aren't necessarily just paying him a whole bunch of money to be on a bad defense. Uh, so I think that's going to be the goal that the Falcons will try to achieve um, this off season. And that means that, you know, they'll have some options um, to uh, make some of those upgrades along the defensive line, along the interior um, this uh, spring and we'll get into what some of those options are as we continue today's lockdown falcons guys but before we get there i do want to plug the peacock and williamson nfl show that will be on the road uh heading to la to cover this big week uh in this matchup between uh, the rams and Bengals. so go check out matt williamson a former nfl scout and nfl analyst brian peacock each and every day on the peacock and williamson podcast available on all the same podcast platforms that you can find locked on falcons uh to get ready for this big game uh, matchup. Now, we know that, you know, there's just one more football game left to be played unless you count the Pro Bowl, which no one does. Uh, you know, and Bet Online is the number one spot uh, that's going to have you covered even though the football season is dwindling. But worry not, you know, even if you're uh, worried about not being able to bet on football, you can still bet on basketball, hockey, boxing, UFC, even your favorite Vegas casino games because betonline.net is your number one online wagering destination. Whether you want to bet on scores or totals or player props or who the next fired coach is, where he's going to land, uh, BetOnline is that number one spot for all those things. Of course, you can also bet on futures bets. Uh, we just passed the one-year anniversary of the Matt Stafford trade to the L.A. Rams, and we're only a few days away, less than a week away from the one-year anniversary where I put in that futures bet because of that trade to have the Rams win the Super Bowl, and hopefully I'll be, you know, raking in a little bit of money uh, in the coming days uh, as we get ready for this big game. But you guys can get ready for the big game by going to betonline.net and signing up. And then BetOnline is the fastest and easiest way to wager on all your favorite sports and favorite games. BetOnline, where the game starts. So today's episode is also brought to you by Rock Auto. With ever-increasing numbers of makes and models, it's now impossible for your local chain auto parts store to stock all the parts you need. Why wait while the person behind the counter orders parts on their computer when you already have access to rockauto.com at home or in your pocket? Save time and money when using Rock Auto. Instead of spending up to twice as much for the same parts from a chain store or car dealership, Rock Auto is a family business serving do-it-yourselfers for over 20 years with reliably low prices for every customer. They have everything you need from brake parts, tail lamps, motor oil, even new carpet. Go to rockauto.com right now and see all the parts available for your car or truck. Right, Locked on in the How Did You Hear About Us box so that they know we sent you. Amazing selection, reliably low prices, all the parts your car will ever need, rockauto.com. So I think, as I just indicated, the Falcons can put themselves much more in a favorable situation from a team standpoint, maybe not from a financial standpoint, by punting uh, the Grady Jarrett decision to next year and, and deciding to pay him big dollars when he's 30 next offseason or whatever the case may be, hoping that he has a rebound 2022 season. And certainly helping uh, that cause would be surrounding him with better talent. Um, and I hope to see the Falcons be a little bit more proactive in free agency to get some of that help. Um, you know, there's plenty of options right now. And certainly as we get later in this offseason, we can really nail down uh, on some of these needs that the Falcons may need specific options as we get closer to free agency in March. But, you know, if the Falcons are looking for more of an upgrade from Anthony Rush as that 3-4 nose tackle, you got some young nose tackles like Josh Tupo and Tim Settle that may hit the market. You also have some options in the draft. Um, if you're looking at free agency, you can find some guys that could help you get after the quarterback, whether that's guys like Bilal Nichols, Daquan Jones, uh, who played under Dean Pease in Tennessee. You got B.J. Hill. We talked about a bunch uh, playing for Cincinnati and, and a big reason why they're um, 
Pass rush improved significantly. Larry Ogunjobi, a teammate of his in Cincinnati as well. If the Falcons are looking for more of a one tech uh, that can sort of be that nose tackle that can bring a little bit more juice as a pass rusher than Tyler Davidson did in that similar role, you got Buffalo's Harrison Phillips, the Rams' Sebastian Joseph Day, Derek Nadi, Foley Fadakasi, Jerron Reed. If the Falcons are looking for some veteran guys that may be a little bit over the hill but may have one good year left in them and you could maybe sign them to a uh, sort of cheaper one-year deal. Uh, you got guys like Akeem Hicks, Brandon Williams, Linval Joseph, Calais Campbell, Sheldon Richardson, uh, Malik Jackson, William Golston, some of those guys that the Falcons could potentially target to help, you know, beef up their run defense. And, and maybe some of those guys have a couple of good years uh, left in terms of pass rush, certainly better pass rushes than any of the Falcons options outside of Grady Jarrett. So certainly upgrades in that regard, even if they're not necessarily the players, you know, that they were in their primes. And then you have potential cap cuts. Stefan Tuitt from the Steelers, Eddie Goldman from the Bears, Star Latulale are some of the names that I've seen as potential cap cuts this offseason. Um, if we're look, talking about trades uh, and getting some guys from that, that 2019 draft class uh, that, you know, are sort of going into their final years of their contracts and have sort of lost snaps over the last couple of years, whether that's due to injuries or other factors. You got someone like Dallas's Tristan Hill. You got uh, Colin Saunders from the Chiefs. Uh, that could be potential trade options for the Falcons that are on those rookie, cheap rookie deals. So wouldn't be particularly expensive from a financial standpoint. And then the question is, you know, what would some of those teams be willing to give up? Uh, you know, and, and maybe a late round pick or something like that, and maybe something worth the Falcons to kick the tires on. So we'll see if the Falcons go after some of those veterans or do they just sort of settle for, you know, some young guys and hope that, you know, and it would make sense for the Falcons to draft uh, some young players because, again, we don't know if Grady Jarrett's going to be here long term. So you would love to see the Falcons sort of situate themselves in a scenario where, you know, somebody could inherit the mantle from Grady Jarrett if the Falcons are forced to move on from him next year or the year after or whatever the case may be. Uh, you want to start that development cycle for the Grady Jarrett era parent now. Um, I'm not as up on this draft class as maybe some others are, you know, there's a handful of, of defensive tackles that I've seen. I don't necessarily see a guy worthy of that eighth overall selection for the Falcons. Um, Jordan Davis, the Georgia nose tackle uh, certainly, you know, makes sense for the Falcons, but probably not that high if they were to trade back into round one or trade up from round two into the back end of round one, uh, it would make a little bit more sense to get Jordan Davis. And especially if we've saw the Falcons, you know, do a better job addressing their pass rush in free agency so that you wouldn't necessarily need Jordan Davis to be an every down player um, and, and be more of that two down player that he's been at Georgia. Uh, his teammate, Devontae White, is probably a little bit more of that three down guy uh, and certainly a guy that seems to be projected as a late one, early two type of guy. Fedarian Mathis from Alabama is a similar sort of prospect that maybe has a little bit more of that ability to, to plug the run um, and, and, and whatnot. Uh, you know, DeMarvin Leal is another guy that I've sort of flirted with in the past. I, I'm I'm sort of I'm not out on DeMarvin Leal, but I, I don't know. He, he to me is a little bit too much of a project, uh, particularly at eight. So if he were to fall to 43 or whatever the case may be, I'd be much more open to to rolling the dice as it were on DeMarvin Leal and see if we can sort of you know, develop him or whatever the case may be. Some of the other no, nose tackles I've seen, Travis Jones from UConn, Neil Farrell from LSU are some of the few guys that I've seen. So sort of in that second tier, they're both at the Senior Bowl this week, uh, you know, behind Jordan Davis. Um, a handful of other guys that are a little bit more pass rushers uh, that I've seen is basically Oklahoma's Perry and Winfrey, who's also at the Senior Bowl as well. Uh, he's he, he seems he's an interesting prospect, um, you know, got some juice or whatever the case may be. So I, basically there's like seven guys, defensive tackles I've seen. Uh, and and so I'm kind of waiting to see how the Falcons, if the Falcons address some of these interior D line needs um, in free agency, and then I'll take a deeper dive at some of these guys as we get into the spring or whatever the case may be and, and start looking for some of those, you know, late day two, uh, day three, early day three sort of options or whatever the case may be. Uh, but, you know, that's kind of where my head's at. I feel like the Falcons do have a, a, a golden opportunity this offseason to really upgrade this position and looking at various websites like PFF and overthecap.com. It doesn't seem like, you know, a lot of these guys I've mentioned, at least in free agency, are going to really break the bank. So I think the Falcons should be able to get pretty good bang for their buck if they're willing to spend like six or seven, uh, possibly eight million dollars a year. They should should be able to get a really good player that they can plug and play and put next to Grady Jarrett and be an impact player for them. Um, so we'll just sort of have to see if they're willing to spend that type of money or if they go 
for more cheaper options. And again, I think they'll be able to get some solid players and cheap side of things. And, and again, do sort of that scattershot approach that we talked about on Tuesday with the edge rusher group and, and maybe potentially adding two or three guys uh, to this defensive line front uh, in free agency before we get to the draft and, and just completely remake this front seven. So uh, we'll just sort of have to see how that goes, guys. Um, but, you know, I think right now, if you're worried or nervous about the Falcons trading Grady Jarrett, I would try to I've tried to do my best to reassure you that it's probably not going to happen. Now, as far as Grady Jarrett playing beyond the 2022 season, again, that's completely up in the air. Um, but I feel reasonably optimistic that Grady Jarrett will be back here in Atlanta. Um, but, you know, in terms of securing him long term, you know, I, I tend to be a little bit more skeptical that the Falcons are in a position where they're going to feel good about, you know, paying anybody this offseason or extending anybody this offseason outside of the guys that are free agents like, you know, Cordero Patterson and, and Foye Oluokun. So we'll just sort of have to see how that goes for them this offseason, guys. And I appreciate you for tuning in for another episode of Locked on Falcons. As always, I have recommendations for your second listen, um, you know, after you make Locked on Falcons your first listen each and every day. And of course, you can check out any of the local shows like Locked on Hawks, Locked on Braves, Locked on Bulldogs. Uh, and of course, check out the Locked on Bets podcast where handicapping expert Lee Sterling is giving you the lowdown on his daily picks, his blowout specials, and of course, his lock of the day. Uh, and hopefully we'll have you some tips to head over to betonline.net uh, so that you can get in on some of those props. I know Lee's going to have some great props for you over the next couple of weeks. So definitely check out Locked on Bet to get some of those props uh, to, you know, wet your whistle a little bit uh, instead of just putting it all on, uh, you know, the team that's going to win. You know who I'm, I'm rooting for because I got money on the line. Uh, but we'll see if I can get some props to sort of hedge uh, that, that bet or whatever the case may be. So uh, check out Locked on Bets, guys. Appreciate it. Uh, tomorrow's episode, we will probably do a mailbag again. I already got some great questions. Uh, via email at lockdownfalcons at mail.com. You guys can hit me up on Twitter at Lockdown Falcons, Facebook at Lockdown Falcons, or of course you can leave a comment here on the Lockdown Falcons YouTube channel uh, to have me answer some of those questions, whatever you want to talk about football. You know, we want to talk about Brian Flores. You want to talk about Tom Brady. You want to talk about the Atlanta Falcons. You want to talk about the draft, the senior bowl, all that very stuff. Uh, I'm more than open. So submit your questions to all those places. Appreciate it, guys. Uh, until then. <laughs>